All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nebra Nelson. I'm the Director of Arts Engagement at Seattle Rep. And I'll give a quick physical description for blind and low vision audience members. I am a light-skinned light brown woman with short brown hair, earrings, a brown jacket, and behind me are black and white photos on a white wall. Uh, welcome to Reimagine Theater, a panel series that brings artists and community leaders together to envision a new theatrical world. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the a traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people past and present here in the city named after Duwamish Chief Seattle. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. And this acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but is rather the very first step in honoring the land we're on. And if you'd like to uh, find more resources um, on how to support the local indigenous communities, uh, please visit our land acknowledgement page on the Seattle Rep website. I really deeply appreciate each and every one of these panelists being here to have this conversation today. Thank you uh, for turning on your videos. Uh, we're doing these panels so that we can envision what a future of equity and justice looks like and how the arts and theater should be a part of that and be a consistent part of community voice. And so the leading questions for this discussion and this panel series are, if you could wave a magic wand and build a new theater landscape, what would you create? And what does theater at the heart of public life look like? For those who are in the Zoom room, feel free to uh, comment or ask questions throughout the conversation in the chat, and we'll integrate that into our discussion. Now I'm going to pass it to my co-facilitator for this panel, Reagan Jackson, and the rest of the panelists to introduce themselves. Hello, Nabra, should I also describe myself or what? Please what do. do. Yes, it would be lovely if each person would give a quick physical description as well. Okay, well, my name is Reagan, preferred pronouns she and her. I am a, a caramel complected black woman with thick natural hair. Um, wearing a red wrap dress with a black jacket and some fabulous chunky turquoise jewelry as an accent. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that, that that's me. <laughs> and um, and Nabra, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I'm, I'm stepping into this as someone who accidentally became an arts critic <laughs> uh, in that I, um, for the last six or seven years have been a freelance journalist with the Seattle Globalist, Seattle, South Seattle Emerald, et cetera. And um, what I was finding is that folks were not covering the events that I wanted to, to have covered. And so I just started going to events and, and giving my opinion. And I don't, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing um, from the other panelists, like kind of where, like how did you get into this work? Um, and where, what is your relationship with art? So as you're introducing yourself, if you would like to, to frame um, your commentary around when and where you enter into this conversation, I think that'd be really helpful. Should we I'll, I'll pass it around. Um, Misha, do you wanna start? Um, yeah, um, Misha Burson. I'm a light-skinned woman with blondish hair and uh, uh, boy, so I'm the old grizzled veteran on this, and I'm the one who actually wanted to be a theater critic uh, to, you know, to boil it down because it's a long story, of course, like for all of our lives. Um, I started writing. Uh, I, I worked in the theater. Uh, I trained as an actor. And then I started writing since writing is my first skill. Um, in the Bay Area, and I became the theater critic for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. I was there for 10 years, and then I was lucky enough to get a job to cover for Wayne Johnson, who was then the theater critic for the Seattle Times. He later just, I went over to teach at UW, uh, thinking I would stay, and then he decided to retire. So I applied for his job, and uh, I got it. And there I was for 25 years. So um, I am active in the American Theater Critics Association. And I have a lot of thoughts after having taught a lot of seminars on criticism and 
trying to stay in touch with the field uh, about uh, what we need to have good criticism um, and uh, good journalism in general. Um, the one last thing I'll say before we get into it is I, I think there are two different, there, it, it, one shouldn't mistake criticism with, uh, or analysis, I should call it really, with um, other kinds of journalism, which are more about simply reporting on the event, letting people know that it's happening, uh, doing profiles, interviewing, you know, Marcy, for instance, is a master at these things. Um, I had to do some of that too, but I, I really was focused more on actually analyzing um, the artistic and uh, contextual meaning of, of the performances. Thank you. Uh, Grace. Hi, so yeah, um, I, my name is Grace Madigan. I am a light-skinned Asian woman um, and I am in my bedroom. So there are some clothes behind me and a couple posters. But um, yeah, so uh, right now I'm the director of the Everbreak, which is a daily newsletter, free daily newsletter that um, aims to connect Seattle lights to their city and with each other. So um, all about building community. Um, my background in sort of, I guess, covering the arts and journalism. I'm a recent uh, University of Washington grad and I've done a lot of freelancing for different publications um, like the Seattle Global List, um, my intern at Seattle Met, other places. Um, but I, I've definitely, my focus has definitely not been hard news. And so I'm familiar with, you know, s some of the arts landscape, mostly music, I would say. Um, I've done some of that for the Everday. And so definitely excited to sort of talk about, you know, a lot of the different aspects of um, the arts in, in the city, so. Thank you. Uh, Marcy. So I am, um... A light skinned white woman with curly gray hair. And I too, Grace, am in my bedroom. And you don't see clothes, you see my bed behind me. Um, I turned a light on so that you could see it. there's a picture on the wall. I uh, recently retired from KUOW, Public Radio, Seattle's NPR affiliate, after 35 years. I've been a journalist for more than 40 years. I uh, how did I start? I don't even remember. That was a long time ago. But I have, I'm have i not a theater critic. I do write criticism, but it's dance criticism. My main job for most of those years um, was covering a range of things, but my passion is to write about the arts. Um, I've done a lot of stories about the rap, um, theater, dance. I, I report locally and also have filed hundreds of stories um, for national outlets, NPR, and um, a lot of national dance publications. That's mostly who I'm writing for now. And after I retired, I realized that there weren't very many arts journalists around. I've done a bunch of mentoring, but there's not many jobs to be had. So I'm launching a podcast later this month with um, a, a wonderful person, Vivian Phillips, who's also been around on the art scene. So that comes out the end of this month and we're really super excited and it's gonna focus on issues in arts and culture. Thank you, we're excited for that too. Uh, Roxanne. Hi, I'm Roxanne Ray. Uh, I am a light-skinned uh, woman with blonde hair uh, with a uh, black sweater on and behind me is a black sofa and sort of a beige taupe colored wall. Um, my background is uh, in theater, uh, primarily as a writer and a dramaturg. And that's the lens that I continue to take while writing about theater, dance and performance. Um, I came to the International Examiner uh, in 2006, wholly by accident, uh, through a friend of mine who had written an article for them. Um, she introduced me to the arts editor there, and um, I began writing uh, at first about theater and then uh, slowly expanding to um, 
dance, uh, other kinds of performance, and then occasionally um, books about theater and um, other uh, related arts, whether that's sound design, lighting design, etc. cetera. Um, I definitely take the uh, lens of a dramaturg in uh, all that I do, uh, especially looking to build bridges between artists and audiences or somehow illuminating the creative process for audiences and just really trying to make that connection and encourage uh, readers and audiences to go partake of the art um, themselves. Lovely, thank you. Well said, Roxanne. Uh, Disha. Hi, my name is Disha Karamanshi. Um, she, her pronouns. Um, I am currently in a white room. It's, it's very bright, but I'm glad about that. I, I love the sun. Um, behind me is a leaf, a colored leaf hanging. Um, yeah, that's the only thing in, in this room. Um, yeah, I am a teenager. I believe I'm the youngest one on this panel. Um, I am a part of Teen Ticks. I am, I'm a youth writer in their newsroom program. Um, yeah, um, my start in arts and in criticism and in theater was actually very recent, only two years ago um, when I started high school. Um, I also fell into it um, very unexpectedly. I found myself in a very dark place coming into high school. And so I just, I wanted to try something new. I was very academically driven through most of middle school and I just needed a different outlet to express myself creatively. Um, but before that, I really loved writing and just criticism and creative writing in general. And so I kind of just fell into this landscape of theater in my school, in my, in my school. And so, yeah, I love to do light, lighting design and sound design, especially on the tech side of theater. And that's kind of how I found Teen Ticks, which is a teens arts organization aimed to uplift youth voices and um, give more opportunities to youth in general, which is really amazing. I really support everything that they do there. Um, and yeah, and from Teen Ticks, I have uh, published stuff in the Seattle Times and on their blog, which is really great. And yeah, I'm very excited to be here and to discuss the future of what we want to see theater looking like. And I'm very excited to hear what you will have to say about this. Thank you. It's great to have you here. We love Teen Ticks. Uh, Leah. Hi folks, I'm Leah Baltus. I am a medium skinned woman with long dark curly hair. Um, and behind me is a really blown out window which has plants on it you can barely see as well as a rad print by Electric Caution. Um, and as far as how I got into this work, um, you know, I was really kind of on an arts and journalism tip from my youth. Um, and I followed that through college and I sort of bobbed and weaved a bit in my early career, um, kind of doing the Hollywood thing for a little bit in my early 20s and then uh, wound up in Seattle where I started a zine. And that zine was covering all sorts of things, but had a definite like art and culture bent and it wound up getting distributed nationally. And then having made not a cent from it, I did shut that down. I was tired. And eventually a kind of communications practice with a writing practice and an ongoing love of the arts in many different disciplines led me to City Arts Magazine, where I was editor in chief for just shy of eight years before it closed at the end of 2018. And I, you know, remain engaged in this space. So I'm not actively working as a journalist. I'm doing a bunch of independent kind of stuff, teaching um, at UW's communications leadership master's program, I'm writing a book, some of which touches on some of these themes, um, doing a bunch of work for arts clients in town and that kind of thing. So that's me. Thank you. It's so great to have you here. Thank you all so much. Uh, I'll pass it back to Reagan, my co-facilitator. Thank you, Nabra, and uh, thank you, panelists. I'm curious, like, what has been what has been the most innovative arts coverage that you've experienced, and what for you is like the marker of of good criticism for a good conversation? Okay. Um, well, I'll throw out some of my thoughts and um, and you know some of them wouldn't have been controversial a few years ago but probably are now by the way I 
I also work with Teen Ticks. I've done some mentoring there and I teach at UW too. Um, and still do some writing for crosscut.com. Um, so in terms of journalism, I think that any coverage, any intelligent, you know, well-sourced coverage of the local art scene is really important right now because we don't have uh, much of an art staff. Uh, when I started at the Seattle Times in 1991, we had um, a theater critic, a film critic, a pop music critic, a jazz critic, a ballet, a dance critic, a uh, pop music critic, a literary critic, and a classical music critic, would you believe? So, you know, it was, uh, and a visual arts critic. So that was common in newspapers at that time. And now we don't have any, any full-time critics except our film critic at the Times. And we have a number of people who are arts, arts writers on the staff, but kind of do all sorts of things. You know, they're assigned to do various things. They don't have a beat like I did that was very specific. And to me, that's a shame because there's just no way you get the coverage that we were able to do back then without people following everything that was going on, you know, in the jazz scene or the theater scene or the dance scene. So uh, uh, I think every kind, as I said, every kind of uh, journalism that uh, informs people about what's going on since a lot of people have no idea what's going on even if they're interested well read um they just don't have those guidelines they don't have those calendars they don't have city arts which was very helpful and just letting people know every month hey that all this stuff is happening um when it comes to criticism i really think that a healthy arts community has people who um, are decent writers and who have thought long and hard and have background uh, of one kind or another in their field and can be analytical about what they're seeing. Um, I'm a little worried that if we move totally toward the realm of feature writing and sort of you know, profiles and interviews that uh, we don't look for those great talents and and discuss why, you know, why these people are exceptional um, and why they deserve more audience. We also don't have somebody who's candidly saying, this didn't work, you know, and uh, the idea may have been good, the concept, the politics, every aspect of the sort of package. But when it comes down to it with the arts, People are dissatisfied in the audience if they don't see good acting, if they don't see good visuals, if they don't if if they don't see something that they consider, even if the you know it's a two dollar and ninety eight budget, um, something of quality uh, that has um, a real core of excellence. And I say that without any elitism, you know, because there are shows at the Fifth Avenue that cost a million dollars that I haven't liked very much and didn't respond to. And then there are, are shows I've seen at the tiniest little basement theaters in town that really excited me. So what I think is important about excellent criticism and about preparing to become a critic is that you see as much as you can, you read as much as you can, you have as open a mind as you can, and you're not serving any constituency. You're not trying to make the artists happy. You're not trying to make, uh, you know, uh, people who agree with you politically happy. You're really trying to capture and describe uh, the event, the artists behind it, and what in your opinion it amounts to. People can argue with you, you're not the last word. But if you have a voice and you have some knowledge and you can give some context to what people are seeing, it's very valuable. That's just my opinion. And I wish, I just wish we had 
you know, more outlets now, whether they're online or otherwise, that value that, that believe in, in arts criticism. We have a few critics left here, but very few. I guess, Misha, I'd take that one step further. There are a few critics, there are a few arts reporters in general. And I think that, you, you know, there's a question from Reagan in our chat, what makes arts coverage good? A, it has to exist for it to be good. And I think it, if, if society continues to see the arts as non-essential, um, one of my bosses recently, before, right before I left, called what I made fluff. Um, I, it's, it's viewed that way from the time people enter the public education system until, you know, it goes on and on until you're old. So there's an over, overarching attitude that it's the least important thing. And in my mind, it's the most important thing. And so I think um, Misha's right in terms of having a background and, and having a real depth of knowledge. But I think if people don't even know um, why something, that, that something is being made, they can't appreciate why it's being made or how it fits in or if it's good or bad because they don't even know about it. So, um, you know, as, as somebody who does do those profiles and features, I would just speak up for the importance of those. And I think um, really the the biggest problem and is that arts has been so separated from people's lives that it's been deemed elitist that it's not seen as something that comes out of every community that's vital in every community that differs um, depending on on you know what you're interested in who you are what your background is and so I, I think the um, established arts community is just starting to understand that right now, um, maybe in the past, well, definitely in the past year, but maybe the past five years or so. And I think um, that extends to the kind of coverage that I know I did, you know, the pivots that I made a few years ago. And, and I think that that, if we talk about, you know, waving a magic wand, Nabra, I think um, part of that wand is for me, um, really making people who don't think it's an essential part of life to see that that arts and culture are vital to us as human beings. So that's, that's what I would add. I just want to uh, echo what Marcy just said and um, you know, just express the importance of having arts coverage so that community members can know what's going on in their community um, with members of their community who may be practicing the arts right alongside them. Um, and then I would just key off uh, something that Misha mentioned, um, the question why. That's something that I really like to dive into when I am talking to artists, um, going beyond the work itself, but looking into their aspirations, their motivations, um, you know, get to those uh, below the surface questions on why did they make the choices they made and so on, just so that audiences can get to know the artists and their work just um, a little bit better beyond what they might see on stage. Um, and, and that's what I like to see in um, arts coverage. Yeah, I'll jump in there and say, you know, that kind of context or I often think about it as like humanizing things or figuring out where the connection points are for an audience or potential audience, you know, making sure that there's a way to sort of draw out what's relevant about something, whether to a community, a specific community, whether to an issue, whether to, you know, just, you know, an art for art's sake kind of reason, um, helping people find those connections and go a little bit deeper and like even get ready, not just to be aware that a thing is happening, um, so that they could potentially go see it, but also like to mentally get their mind around it so that they're even ready for the criticism kind of side of things after the fact, because I think a lot of times criticism is speaking to a narrow audience and I'm 100% on board with, um, you know, at, the, at this stage anyway, I'm, I'm very on board with critics being extremely knowledgeable. I think it's important to show respect to the work that's being made by bringing that kind of 
knowledge to the table. Um, but somehow that gets us into this rarefied space. And I know that at City Arts, the, by far the things that trafficked the worst um, were uh, reviews. And I don't think that's because re reviews aren't very important. I think they are very important, but I think there's some kind of a gap there that happens with like media literacy potentially, or like wherever that kind of values breakdown starts to happen in terms of like where arts and culture are sitting in the society, you know, more broadly, um, you know, because people do value these things, but they don't value them with money. And so that's a breakdown, you know, that where is that value? We just sort of expect it to materialize like a bunch of, you know, fairies just sprinkling it out in the world. Um, so, you know, all these different things, there are different chasms where it sort of breaks down. And so you have to build the bridge from the thing exists to the thing is covered in a thorough and credible way to the thing is reviewed in a way that the audience can appreciate that is accessible and knowledgeable and somehow try to lift that um, value across the board so that there is money to support it and tickets to be bought and that the whole ecosystem can be functioning. Yeah, I I'll just, just oh, I, I just want to add one thing if it's okay. Um, I don't think anymore that criticism has to be over here because what you're talking about, you know, three different stories about the same piece, forget it, that's not going to happen anymore. We just don't have the pipeline for that. But I think Marcy is a very knowledgeable person. She goes to everything. I mean, I'd see, I'd see her at things that, you know, she would probably not normally go to, except she wanted to educate herself on what's happening. So even if you're writing, you know, uh, about something and you're not officially being a critic. Um, and then the other short point I'll make is that one of the problems about previewing things is you have not seen them and you don't know the value. And if there's any, thing I would suggest to somebody who is privileged to be in that position of writing regularly about the arts, go see it first. You'll have more to say about it. You'll have more to reach out about it. And there'll be some things where you'll say, you know, this is not worth the ink that I could be giving to something that I think is more important. So that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so talking a little bit more about that, when it comes to getting people to go see art in the first place, I think, especially with my um, demographic, with teenagers, we have a lot just in general going around us when it comes to technology and things that we're doing. And so art kind of tends to just fall a little bit because we have so much that is going on and just a lot of things that are happening. And so even for me, just getting into the door of like arts community was really hard because I never saw what was there in the first place in general because that I wasn't looking for it. I, I just I just happened to stumble upon it. And I'm very glad that I did because I don't know what I would be doing if I was not here. Um, but I think getting people to that door and just kind of opening it for them is the most important step because once you're there, I think it's really easy to kind of navigate the art space and the arts community because you just meet people and you see things and you just keep going to support these people. And it, 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 is, an, it is a community and especially Seattle's community, it's really close. And once you're there, you're there and you just kind of know everyone. And so getting someone to that door first is really important. And I think getting people there at a young age or it doesn't matter what age, but getting people there young would be great because then they would support for years and years and years. And so I think just utilizing the different spaces that arts has come to, um, especially with the pandemic and COVID and arts kind of having to move to an online space, um, utilizing social media, TV, um, just video and things like that, kind of adapting arts criticism to these different venues that um, people will tend to look at more is just really important because I think even though I really love just the writing and things like that, and that's what I prefer to view my art as, I know a lot of other people don't. And so moving to that to make sure that art is alive for everyone is, is just really important. Yeah, just to add on to what everyone else has already said, um, I think, you know, to go back to the question of like, what makes good, like, you know, criticism, arts criticism, for me, it's like, you know, like, 
everyone's been saying is like, take someone who's like a real wonk about, you know, whatever they're talking about. So it's like, they're able to connect X, Y, and Z and present to you in a way like why they think this way. But then also I think for me, I really like critics who can like put, you know, imbue some of their own perspective and stuff. So, you know, I think part of that is, you know, making sure that the people who are getting into criticism stuff are coming from different backgrounds with different perspectives. And um, I think that's something, you know, uh, Nisha was just kind of touching on is that like, I, I do think for younger generations, when you say arts and then you think arts, you go to when their eyes start to glaze over or whatever but like art encompasses so much right and um so to really change the narrative about what art can be and how we should value it i think is is so important in and you know making sure that uh art criticism i think evolves and develops and we get more new unique voices in there um is just to make it you know more accessible like like everyone yeah i think for youth especially i think it's just a common stereotype in general like oh we're on our phones we're on TikTok all the time or whatever and we're just so disconnected from reality and things like that and i think that there is a, a scent of truth to that but um, in my time in the arts community, I have met so many teenagers who are so incredibly young and just youth in general who are so connected to the arts and are just so passionate about it that their passion and their interest is just so infectious that I just get more interested in things I want to see and the people around them just really get into it. And so I think just making it something that's just interesting and exciting and getting people to want to see these things. At the end of the day, when um, talking to youth, we shouldn't talk down to youth because I think they can understand just as much as anyone else can. And I really like in um, reviews and things like that, I think Misha, you were talking about this, but like getting really analytical and really personal, I think is just so cool to see because we're humans and humans respond to emotion and things like that. And it's really cool to see in arts pieces and arts criticism and making sure that teens and just everyone has access to this. So people aren't left out of the loop, I think is just really important when it comes to that. I want to I want to make a pitch here for the American Theater Critics Association because uh, in the last few years, uh, my organization, which was largely white and male for many years, uh, is now really reaching out, and we have uh, many more uh, arts writers of color. They're from all over the country. Um, we had a conference about that, which was very interesting, and um, I think that it's beginning to happen that that what some of the things you're talking about in terms of access and involvement of other points of view other writers is you know encouraging it's really sad to me that some of the great people who belong to the organization now who are in their 20s you know have to do five jobs to to exist but um i'd encourage anybody who is kind of serious about this to to look at their website, American Theater Critics Association, and see if there's something there for you. They really, really are, are reaching out and looking to involve in a serious way, not just a kind of bullshit, you know, window dressing way, um, young critics and young critics of color. I think that's a really good kind of segue just to to talk a bit more about um, about culture and about access points, and I'm wondering how folks view um, what is what is the responsibility of arts critics to to understand and engage with the culture that's producing the art, and then also how how have you navigated your own identity politics or personal bi bias when covering arts? Um, I, I'd like to talk about that. Uh, a few years ago, I really did a lot of deep soul searching, Reagan, and, and thought about what I had been covering and who I was covering. And so the first thing that I did was actually um, ask 
a, as wide an audience as I could, who I should be covering. Um, and it, evo it evolved into something called artists you should know. And, and so it's a lot of, of listening, I think, and really, um, you know, there's a knowledge base. Misha's right. I go to see over the years. I've seen a lot of performances and I cannot wait to be back in a theater of small, big, you name it. I just want to be sitting with people again. But I, I think that one thing that I have really thought about as, an, as somebody who has done a lot of interviews is that listening, it really is the, the foundation. And so, you know, whoever you're covering, it, you need to approach with respect, but also with, with that ear and mind open without the preconceived ideas of what you're going to see. And that could be, you know, a swan lake with a whole bunch of white girls in white swan outfits, which is nice, or it could be um, a, a very radical um, art show that is made by a lot of young people of, of color who have a very specific message. And so I, I really think, uh, I had a friend years ago when I was at a NEA fellowship who said he entered everything with his heart chakra open and, and waited to receive it. And I think that is really fundamentally um, how I try to go about anything, whether it's just a calendar listing, thinking about where I'm going, but but really trying to understand and hear. And, and if I make a mistake, be willing to listen to people tell me I made that mistake because that's happened not infrequently in my career. I really appreciate these questions um, because both of these questions about engaging with the culture are foundational to the work I do at the International Examiner. So for those who are not familiar with the Examiner, it is uh, the oldest and largest nonprofit media outlet here in the Pacific Northwest focused on uh, the um, Asian Pacific American community. And so it may seem uh, you know, unusual that I might be a, a longstanding writer given that I am not uh, Asian or Pacific American. Um, but what I have uh, done with the um, encouragement of uh, our arts editor, Alan Lau, um, is to really try to um, listen, as Marcy would say, um, really try to understand the, uh, the artists and how they emerge from their communities and how they want to relate to their communities and really open space for their voices in uh, the writing that I do. So it's uh, much less about uh, my opinion about uh, their work, but really just trying to give them that opportunity to uh, speak to their larger community and facilitating that, um, being the ear that listens, the, uh, the, the questioner that asks uh, why and uh, what are your challenges and really trying to get to the bottom of the the um, artistic process and then um, sharing that out um, to the broader community. In addition to all of that, you know, I think it's important to say that, um, you know, bringing writers to the fore to cover work that is, you know, tied to coming from some kind of relationship with a community that they know does make a big difference, you know, and um, you know, that's not always possible. And so we do our best under different cir circumstances, but um, I think that that kind of, um, you know, speaks to the reason why we need this diversity of writers, you know, of all sorts of different people with all kinds of different knowledge culturally and otherwise um, to bring that, that point of view to the work. Um, you know, I certainly know that as we widened our contributor base at City Arts, the, um, the, the sort of scope of what we were able to address got bigger, you know? And then as much as I am 100% on board with the idea of listening also, and that same kind of stance that I take when I'm in that journalist role, um, I don't know what I don't know. I do screw up and it, there's only so, so much that I can 
get from that kind of agnostic neutral kind of trying to be neutral, even though I'm not kind of place, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, just to say, you know, more voices equals more knowledge equals more cultural competency equals maybe a shifting dynamic around all of this 20 years down the road where like whatever the kind of differences might be of who covers what and things like that might change. But yeah, it can't, it can't be under said how valuable that really is. Yeah, totally. Um, I think that, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but um, I think, uh, you know, arts and culture is like, you, you hear that phrase arts and culture, like, you know, they go together for a reason sort of thing. Um, and so it's totally like, you know, not talking about one without the other, I think is really hard to do. And so that's why there's such a responsibility um, for critics, journalists, so the, when they cover one, they should probably address the other one. Um, I think for me personally, when I am covering something that's like uh, outside of my own community or communities that I'm a part of, um, one of the things that I really think about is, you know, of course, listening, but also doing my research ahead of time. So really making sure that I come in where with, you know, as best of an understanding that I can so that I'm asking questions that go beyond maybe the ones that they're always asked because I think that's something where it's like you get an interview with someone and then you know they probably have got it a bunch of times like what is it like being like an Asian American like you know in the hip-hop industry or something like that and while it's like important to talk about that if that's already been asked a bunch of times you know doing your research and making sure that you, you know, sort of go beyond those layers so that we're not just tokenizing these people um, and artists, um, I think is, is equally as important. I, I think that's really, that's really a good point. Um, I personally want to hear from critics of all different backgrounds what they think about Shakespeare or what they think about, uh, you know, the, the latest play that won the Tony or, or whatever. Years ago, many years ago, I was asked to put together the first anthology of Asian American plays. Um, and, you know, while today, I'm sure that an Asian American critic would be asked and that would be appropriate. It just happened that because I lived in San Francisco and I covered all this work by David Henry Wong and uh, Philip Gatanda and, you know, a number of really great Asian American writers and I had seen a lot, I was able to do that and uh, to, you know, write the foreword and historical foreword and so on. And I consider that, you know, a great privilege and also a very rich experience for me to be able to see these wonderful playwrights in their earliest stages. Uh, there just happened to be produced a lot in, in, Southern, in Southern and Northern California at the time. So, you know, maybe it isn't right now that this is gonna happen like Grace said, but I hope eventually I'd love to hear, you know, every kind of writer uh, from every kind of background talking about everything, whether it's, you know, the, the latest Broadway musical or as, as Marcy said, a, traditional tutu <laughs> swan lake or we may be going through a period now because it's so new to have such a range of, of critics represented that that's not you know what's going to happen for a while but um, I, I hope that you know eventually it is I don't think we should be um, segmented uh, our intellects and our imaginations as writers should be put in a box you know the grace you're just the asian american you know arts journalist and everything you do has to be about that and about that in a specific way so um that's my hope for the future definitely um so i think that in terms of awareness in the past couple of years our awareness when it comes to identity and identity politics um, has increased and I'm very grateful for that. But I feel like when, in a way it comes from me, I, I think I forgot to mention in the intro, um, 
Um, I am an Indian uh, dark skinned woman. And so um, when I navigate any art spaces, I tend to, before I go into it, I tend to think, um, do I present myself as an Indian person? Do I just present myself as someone who is just a person? Or what do I do when I come into the space? How do I want people to see me? And as I grew up and as I kind of wrote things and put out stuff, I always wanted to present myself as some that that was someone that was faceless because I didn't really want to appeal to any specific audience based on my kind of identity when it comes to my ethnicity, because I was always very afraid of kind of the stuff that would happen if I did that. And I think it's okay if you don't want to put your identity out there, that's perfectly valid. And if you do want to put your identity out there, that's also valid too. But I think that there are a lot of pros and cons to come with it because for me, my the reason that I was afraid and I still am afraid of making my ethnicity kind of the forefront of what I write about is because if I do that kind of like Misha, like you said, um, getting boxed into that narrative like I am an Indian writer I always need to put my experiences of being an Indian female into my work and then me saying do people want to hear this do people want to know about this when I just want to write about something that I love and I don't really want to look at this through a, a lens of race and and it is really good to do that but sometimes when I look at things I just want to look at it for the artistic value and that's also really valid too and the, the, that's it's not just very apparent in the arts field, like typecasting and things like that, in theater and movies. It's, it's just really prevalent. And I, I really hate seeing that, especially when we are trying to bring a lot of people forward in casting and diversity, um, just making sure that the normalcy of people of color is being shown through daily life is, is just really important. And not everything needs to be about like starting a conversation. We just wanna hear a diverse representation of voices to be shown and to be heard in the arts community. And I, I really am looking forward to seeing that. And I think that is starting to happen with the awareness that is coming up. I think with um, the voices that we wanna hear, we wanna hear people starting conversations and we also wanna hear people just being normal and talking about their daily lives. And we just wanna hear a little bit of everything from everyone and hopefully we can start getting that in the arts field, just not just in criticism, but everywhere else. Yeah, and in some ways, maybe that's sort of, you know, you encapsulate like the complexity of all of this, you know, everything that we're all saying points to the fact that there really is no answer to the question or pair of questions that Reagan has asked us, maybe, but it's more about a willingness to be kind of perpetually interrogating these things and holding ourselves to account from a million different directions and letting that prism shift, you know, as awareness changes on an individual or a societal or a cultural level. You know, I think that's really well put, and I I want to uh, also throw it back to Reagan this question um, because uh, Reagan, you put a lot of yourself into your journalism. Um, your book still here, a South End mixtape from an un unexpected journalist, which is an author name, um, which is funny also because there are so many folks who kind of shared that they were in some ways unexpected journalists in this uh, group, but. In that book, it's an amalgamation of a bunch of different journalism from a lot of, for many, many years, including a lot of arts journalism. And there's a lot of yourself in there and um, and you, the way, from the way that you approach that writing. And so I'm wondering how, how you approach your writing through this um, lens of identity politics and um, and kind of also transitioning into thinking of like, well, where do we go for he from here? What What is, what do you want to see, I think, from a personal standpoint for each of you, what do you want to see more of in arts journalism that, or, and arts criticism that you're not seeing? Ooh, thanks for that framing, Nabra. Um, definitely, I feel like I have unwittingly put myself as in the position of being a counter narrative. Um, and that wasn't necessarily what I started out to do, but when you begin, you know, when you begin writing, um, I think one thing that comes up is 
is kind of, uh, as you're reading everyone else's work, what are the holes, what are the gaps? And what I was seeing particularly in, in arts coverage is sometimes like I would go to a show and somebody else would go to a show and we'd like cover it, but I'd be like, did we go to the same thing? <laughs> because I saw something completely different than this other person <laughs> saw. And that's what really, what really came up for me um, around embracing my identity, embracing all the, all the parts of who I am is that being a black American woman <laughs> in, in this time and in this place like has given me a lot of perspective with which to to have a critique, to have you know a perspective and a view. And rather than um, silencing that or marginalizing that, I I have often made the choice to be like, okay, well, I'm going to tell you who I am, and then I'm going to tell you what I saw and what I think and why, um, and and then after that, you know, we can have a dialogue about what you saw and who you are and what you think and why, um, and I don't know, I kind of I I feel like I identify with a bit of what Disha says around like not always wanting to have to do all of that prep work but feeling like so often I'm in conversations with folks who need that additional context for me to even begin to understand what it is I'm even talking about. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's one of those situations I feel, I feel a bit, uh, sometimes I'm like, you're welcome. And I feel a little like a jerk, but I'm like, no, really, I'm giving you this gift. I'm giving you the gift of, of what I've learned and what I've earned through this through this process and I want that to be um, seen. Um, I think it's not surprising that here we are a bunch of female identified folks on this call <laughs> uh, because so often uh, in the same way that the, the arts are marginalized, I, I feel like women are, are invisibilized in our work and our perspective and our critiques are, are often just, oh, that's cute, you know, relegated to I don't know, the, the chick lit shelf, <laughs> if that makes a sense, makes any sense. So yeah, I, I find visibility as a tool to, to work around that and to say, okay, well, let's, let's really get into it. Let's really talk about it. But yeah, I, I would love to hear from others about kind of what your process is and, and kind of what, what Nabra had said before, the central question around, um, if you could wave a magic wand, like how how would we want to reinvent this? What what is your ideal? Well, one thing I'd love to see is I write occasionally for this um, website called Oregon Arts Watch in Portland, and somehow this woman has put her money into this really good website <laughs> that is run by, you know, two guys I know who used to be arts editors at the Oregonian, which also has very little arts coverage now. And it is a beautiful site. I encourage you to look at it um, because they cover a, a wide range of things. They have, you know, real good writers of all different backgrounds, but they somehow have found someone who was willing to back this and make it a really, you know, good looking site that a lot of people consult. The problem with, of course, a lot of blogs, we all learned, you know, uh, the average blog is read something like by five people a month. I mean, it's, you know, blogs are just everywhere. And that has not been the answer unless you are able to find some serious backing to promote the blog to give it the range and depth that you want to, to make it look great. So um, one of the things I'd really like to see is somehow getting either commercial investors or foundations to put some serious money into that. I know Leah, you guys really tried to save um, your outlet and it was, you know, a valiant effort that didn't didn't work, but um, I'm, you know, I just hope that 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 
there can be a united effort. And I think, I really hope the arts organizations get behind something like this too. They've got their own problems, but it's only going to be beneficial to them. But Misha, um, don't you think that it's a bigger problem than just finding somebody with money? I mean, I go back to how Americans, so let's just focus on Americans, how we even perceive arts and culture and society. I don't think it's ever going to be, I, I think we can start a million things, but it's never going to have that kind of, of uh, valuation that we really need until society really values what our, what art is within it. And so that's a long-term project. Yeah. Marcy. That, but you know, I think you have to work on more than one track at once. It, yeah. Yes. That's about education and our educational system. And I think we have to do what you're, what you're saying is fundamental. Yeah. I, I guess I just, you know, I'm, I'm old and I've, I've gotten hard bitten and cynical as I've watched my co my coworkers, my colleagues disappear. Misha talked about all the, the critics who used to be at the Seattle times. It's always just been me um, covering like everything. Um, okay. I did have a coworker who went to King FM so he could just focus on music, Dave Beck. Um, but that was it, you know, and it was a constant fight and it was a constant fight because I think art is seen as the least important thing. I, I still subscribe to the Seattle Times and there's a whole section that's all about sports teams and art, you know, is sometimes there's an article with the Northwest section, which now is like two pages long. So even the local news isn't that important. I spend hundreds of dollars a year for this leaflet that hardly tells me the stuff I want to know. So I mean, I, I agree with you. There has to be a lot of different fronts. Like I'm excited about um, the city of Seattle's creative advantage program, because I think we have to really value art at a, a deeply fundamental level to even make a place for the discourse about it. I mean, we could write, but if nobody wants to read what we write or listen to what we say, um, we're just, our words are just going off into the wind. So that's my cynical and not magic wand that's like, prove me wrong, Disha, prove me wrong, Grace. It does seem to have to operate on every single level. And I mean, I know the heartbreak of putting your life into something and having it just like go off the cliff, you know? Um, and so you can make something that people really value and love and it still can run out of money, right? So how do you insulate against that, right? How do you, come at it from all sides, address the really deep stuff that has to do with like American whackness and um, get to that education place, you know, and also have arts coverage, arts criticism, either or, or both um, happening at every level, you know, happening on a project-based level, happening on an Instagram level and a TikTok level and a blog level and happening on a, you know, more robust marketing money behind it kind of website that's getting more traffic, having some kind of stake planted in the, the big outlets, you know, like KOW and the Times. Um, finding ways to make that feasible, you know, I think sometimes, obviously, you know, Misha and Marcy can speak to this at much greater depth, but sometimes there's even support for that kind of thing in the big places, but there isn't, a, they can't make that financial calculation, right, because there is like a whole other downward pressure that's happening for the people making those choices, and so how do we offset that, and so I do think there is something where, you know, we can be cultivating individual support for membership type things like what we try to do with city arts and whatnot. Um, we can have more public radio type um, support and do, you know, try to cultivate the kind of thing like KXP has or KUOW has. Um, and I think government and philanthropy do play a role. And, you know, what that looks like is a kind of new wave of figuring out how journalism works in general, because it raises all these credibility and control concerns. But, um, you know, I know a couple of you guys, Reagan and Marcy were both part of a, a research project I did two years ago, I think, um, 
for the Office of Arts and Culture, where we were trying to figure out this question, like, what do you actually do? What's the intervention? If you're the Office of Arts and Culture and you see how important this kind of work is to the city's creative vitality and to its identity as a place, then what do you do? And so we came up with like some real things. You know, we talked to arts and media educators, we talked to critics, we talked to PR people and like collected and synthesized all this information. And there were some cool ideas that came out of that. Now, granted, I delivered this report of how that all happened like two months before COVID or something, three months. And so one hopes that it will be able to get like dusted off and put that plan back into action in some way. But we were talking about things like an aggregator that would help to lift up all these different types of work that people are doing, um, that would have an editorial board that was like pulled from the community to help guide it in some kind of way. We were talking about um, grants for things like internships and other kinds of like criticism efforts that are so hard to defend from a financial point of view, other special projects. We were talking about different kinds of professional development and even PR support for the smaller entities that can't afford to even interact with any sort of a media situation, you know? So if there, if that even that is an ecosystem unto itself. But I think that if we take that ecosystemic approach in every way of slicing it on every axis, um, then that's the only way, right? Because otherwise, like there are five people with these jobs anymore. And how can we do any of the things that we're talking about, even in terms of just like, A, doing good work and B, having a, a diversity of voices who can represent all the things. Like we can't do any of that if there's only five jobs. So um, yeah, big, big thing to take on. And, you know, kudos to the rep for hosting this conversation. And it goes far beyond the theater coverage part of it as well. You know, it's, it's, it has to be all the arts simultaneously in order for the ship to actually rise. And then it's all of culture. And then it's, you know, how does that just widen and widen and widen? And then we're back to Disha's point about like, how do you get people to be involved? And how does everyone get invited to the party, you know? Yeah, I think that ecosystem concept is really important because when I think about uh, transforming a landscape for both arts coverage and for theater in general and the arts in general, I do think of community conversations and I think of uh, making everything participatory. So what is a format that's not just a one-way conversation where we are delivering some kind of coverage or some kind of criticism or some kind of write-up, but how do we make that um, a a community conversation that other people can uh, participate in. How do we make it a forum? Yes, there are, you know, maybe ways to comment on some outlets, but a lot of times it's like throwing comments into the black hole and it's not really um, as much of a conversation as might be um, uh, inspiring to both artists and audience members. Uh, so um, I don't know. I, I magic wand uh you know how to make how the magic wand makes uh you know uh, in a community I, space like that i i just have to say that for about nine years i i did that i tried to do that i i forced KOW to may, let me have post-show conversations. It was a program called Front Row Center. And then I nagged all the arts organizations to give ticket discounts to people for these events. And the last one was supposed to be, um, Nabra, was it last May, May 15th? It was supposed yeah. to be, yeah, um, Lydia and the Troll was supposed to be at the rep. It was my last one because I was supposed to retire that day. But my idea was like, I'd love to convene groups of people to go around to different things. And The Stranger did that with Teen Ticks, which was, I think, um, I think it was David Schmader who did that, took a, Disha, were you around at Teen Ticks when he did that, where he brought people to every show that On the Boards produced? I thought that was a fabulous idea. And I'm not sure if, if people wrote about it afterwards, but they talked. And I, I so I was doing a different version of that. And, and it was, you know, my idea was that you raise the curtain with an audience and the generative artists so that there can be that direct interaction. And I think that I totally agree, Roxanne, that needs to happen. 
think in terms of like waving a magic wand and making the landscape for arts coverage just a lot more easier, I think, with just making making art a lot more accessible to a lot of different communities. I think with the pandemic and COVID and everything, when art made its shift to online, it was really hard for everyone. And even though I really dislike viewing art online and I much rather prefer like the in-person experience as I believe everyone hopefully would. Um, the online experience was a lot more accessible though. Like I believe I saw an online exhibit of something that I think was an in-person exhibit in Florida. And so you can just see stuff from everywhere in the world and ticket prices went down a lot. So you could just sit with your family and get other people involved that way. And I think that was just a huge pro of online art in general, though I am very happy of things moving back to exhibits and in-person and things like that. But I, I do hope that we don't lose that um, from the pandemic, just trying to move like a few things to the online space so people who don't get to experience art can do so like that. Um, but I think also when it comes to, I think Marcy and and everyone else was talking about this, um, like putting monetary like value in art, um, it also kind of depends on what society values in general, like the tech industry and things like that and medicine and it's like STEM. It's it's very it's being driven a lot right now. And you look at what um, a lot of youth and people in general are studying and it's just a lot of tech and a lot of this stuff, which is really great. But I feel like art is being lost there, especially I think. Um, with Americans and the whole world is kind of looking at these really advanced industries and things like that to move forward. And art is just is just being lost, I feel like, because it's it's not advancing in the same way. And people are like, oh, look at Hollywood, look at that. There's so much money there. There's so many people, there's stars and celebrities and and whatever. But I don't think that's entirely true because what about the art down here at, at the local level, which has as much love put into it and as much support and as much passion into it, if not more. And a lot of people are forgetting about that. And I feel like it's really important to shine a light on that than just the Hollywood image and things like that. And just people in general are forgetting about it. And parents and everyone is like, oh, you need to um, go into a lucrative business and things like that. And it, that is, there is a sense of truth in that. But I think that young people are going towards that idea of a more lucrative business than passion, which which makes sense. And I, I get why, but I think that's why arts, the arts in general and arts criticism is, is losing a lot of people. And it's just harder these days with the idea of growth being the number one thing that is driving our society forward. Um, it, 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 that's that's what everything is about. It's just growth and moving forward and advancement and things like that. And a lot of people are being left behind in this mindset. People of color are being left behind. Uh, socioeconomic communities that aren't doing so well are being left behind. And and art is being left behind because of that growth mindset. And I feel like we just only need to take a step back and reevaluate our beliefs in this kind of area and just kind of sit down and, and, and just chill out a little bit. and make sure that we can pick up things that we left behind and 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 give value to things that historically had value before for other people and making sure that people in general of all identities get to have a, a, a space to sit down and just work in. Well, not to yeah, sound patronizing, Disha, but you make me feel very hopeful. <laughs> you are the youngest person here and it's gonna be up to you and people who feel this way to fight for this um as time goes on and I, I hope you continue feeling as passionate about it yeah just to go off of that I think <laughs> I always get so frustrated when people are like so like stem focused because it leaves out like the arts and I know there's like steam and but like not all not everyone like uses that but like you know, everyone's like, oh, you should get a job in STEM, you should get, you know, you should fo focus on engineering or whatever, because that's definitely going to make money, just kind of going off of what everyone's been saying about how we value arts. Um, that's, that's definitely something that's, that I think, like, starts, you know, it starts with, like, at, at home, you know, with parents who are willing to, like, you know, make time for that kind of stuff, um, but it also, like, um, starts with, like, uh, accessible experiences that's the other part we've been talking about so you know making having schools classes you know go on field trips to museums or whatever having things like team tickets where 
you know, going to shows and stuff is actually accessible. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted to talk about was like, just from like a journalism standpoint and like being a recent college grad is just the importance of like making sure there's like internships and opportunities. So like grants or whatever for like uh, young critics, um, people who like DJ were really interested in this and like summer break or whatever they want to do an internship with Seattle Met or something, um, they can do that so that they can make those connections and they can get that practice. Like the internships that I had, um, all of them were unpaid. And so I had to, you know, like make that decision. I was fortunate that I was in a financial situation where it was okay. Um, but like, you're leaving so many people out of like, uh, journalism just in general when you don't offer those opportunities to them because they financially cannot do it and I think that's just such a shame and such it's such an easy way to like you know bring these uh marginalized voices and these different perspectives um in to like arts criticism and whatnot and so I just I just really think um outlets that do exist like you know um, that can offer mentorship or an internship or whatever, or making sure that they're reaching back down and uplifting those voices and supporting those people who are interested in this. Because as as we're seeing, like kids and young people who are into this exist, you know. Um, so just really making sure that we're fostering this in um, in the youth. I think something that you just said in there, Grace, kind of before the internship tip, which I think you're totally right. Um, thinking about like parents at home and how they model this kind of value system. Um, and then that made me think a little bit about what, you know, the framing uh, or the driving forces behind this series for this panel, right? And like, it's sort of in this moment where we've now lived through this COVID experience up to this point and everything else major that's been going on in the meantime. And people are changed by that, right? Like I know I feel certain ways that my values have shifted and I can't imagine that most people don't feel that in some way, right? And so is this a moment when telling the story of this, right? Telling the story of this cultural issue meets a media problem you know there's a very complex thing that we're sort of trying to untangle but like maybe this is the time when the receptivity is the highest you know maybe this is the time where the chances for these interventions to actually work and like course correct are the greatest and that the, the, the artists and the arts journalists alike can have you know a, an impact in moving the needle now in a way that would have been harder to do even just, you know, two or three years ago. So, you know, I, I almost, it makes me wonder what folks think about like, how do we seize this moment? If I'm allowed to ask a question, <laughs> it's in my blood. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, how do we seize this moment? How do we usher in the kind of change that we're, you know, we're beaming out this vision collectively. It seems a long way off. So how do we uh, grab the, the strings or the reins of, of now? That's such a good question, Leah. And I think you're right. I think the uh, if I could be Pollyanna about a pandemic that has shut down every arts organization in the world and cost tens of millions of people jobs, um, the upside is that it's given everybody during closure time to rethink, you know, the rep, uh, you know, we're here as guests of Seattle Repertory Theater. And I totally appreciate that, that I really see work being done on the parts of arts organizations. I have, I, I have to say, I'm not, I haven't been in a newsroom for 18 months because we were all sent home in March of 2020. So the conversations about change um, in the houses of, of mainstream media I'm not sure are keeping pace with the conversations that are happening with the arts organizations within them themselves. So I see, I, I'm hoping I'm, to be really optimistic 
that the, the structural changes at the organizations themselves are gonna drive the kinds of, of coverage and the way that, that we in the media get to respond to, to what they're producing, what they're creating. I hope that. And there's your podcast, that's gonna help. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I know between you and Vivian, the vibes will be heavy. <laughs> so. Well, I had to laugh because when Disha and Grace were talking about STEAM, I'm, I've been editing a conversation with Trish Maline Zico of the Technology Access Foundation and Tina Lapadula, who's the education manager for the Office of Arts and Culture about just this very subject and, and about um, equity in education. So. That's episode three coming in July. But you know, it, it's something that I actually was happy to step away from the kind of coverage that we're talking about here because the longer that I did this, I mean, 40 years is a really long time to do anything. Um, I stopped asking what and started to ask why. And um, so I, I look for, I was thrilled to participate, Leah, in your study for the city of Seattle and um, hope that, that that report, those recommendations that you made do get dusted off because I think that the kind of, of um, really inclusive um, arts journalism with the kind of, of internships that Grace and Disha are talking about cannot exist with the media landscape as it is. There must be some kind of, of support and, and I, for years, I used to shop around the idea of like an associated press of the arts where everybody would come together. And I'm sorry, Misha's gone because the Seattle Times, it was like, what? We're not going to collaborate with you. I did get them to work on a project, but I think, I think that we're stronger together, especially because there are so few jobs. And Grace, God love you for taking unpaid internships. That's illegal. We want to pay you. And so at, at KUOW, um, just if you're interested, this would be for Disha, um, Radioactive, our youth media training program, I worked a lot with that. Those are paid. Those, those you know, you apply. It's pretty competitive, but those are paid. I've trained at Teen Ticks. So I, I just think there has to be a way to really acknowledge financially the, the kind of training that we need to see and the mentorship that we want to provide. So I will shut up now. Yeah, I, I think in terms of making um, arts um, and putting arts in the forefront of things again and getting more people involved, I think we need to take advantage of the momentum that we already have surrounding awareness of, um, of, of, of identity and um, of arts in general. And I think coming out of the pandemic, I think it's a great time to do that because people are hungry for, for art in general. Everyone wants to go back. Everyone wants to go see things. And I think if we just take advantage of this momentum and this kind of rush of people just wanting to go back to a sense of normalcy now, I think, um, I think arts in general can just get out of the ground and, and, and take advantage of social media and just different types of media in general, um, like blogs and, and YouTube and, and just everything where just anyone can go see, can go to go see things, um, making things more accessible, making sure that younger audiences are interested, especially, and can go see it. And I think just making things a lot more simpler, I think, um, would just be really nice just so everyone um, of all types of backgrounds can be interested, can go and see things and just making sure that that passion is there, which I, I think it definitely is. And it's so unfortunate that people are not seeing that. But I think with this momentum that we have going back into things, I think hopefully people will start seeing things and just get way more excited to go back into art and exhibits and things like that. I think we can start to uh, close out, but I'd love to hear from, uh, to, to kind of end with it, and I'm sure a, sure a mic drop will happen, as there have been many. Uh, I'd love to hear from Reagan um, on this subject of uh, waving a magic wand, um, and then we'll close out here. 
Ooh. <laughs> uh, there's, there's always so much. Uh, in terms of the internships and the financial piece, what keeps coming up for me is uh, having had the opportunity to visit Cuba, it was really fascinating to be in a country where, you know, a doctor theoretically will make the same amount as a street musician. So if there's zero like financial incentive to, to choose a specific path, like folks are really making that decision based on, on what it is that they really want to do, like what's in them to do. And what I found was in Cuba, there was so much amazing art and dance and music and, and it felt like an art attunement just being there. Like I, I felt like they just poured the art into me and I came back and I was painting for days. Um, but there was something really, like if I could wave a magic wand, I think there's something really powerful in uh, taking us out of a space where there are have tos. Like, oh, I have to go to work because I need to make money to pay for you know my life or I have to, do this because it's prestigious and people will see me as in a certain way if I'm doing this. Um, so I think my magic wand would involve like uh, helping people connect directly with their purpose. And if their purpose is solely like, I'm here to put together this art or I'm here to sing this song or you know write this theater piece or do this musical, like I think that that in and of itself would change the shape of, of art and change the shape of of then how we would receive it and how we would we how we would feel um, called to engage with it. Um, the other thing that that really comes up for me is around uh, tokenizing and feeling like while there there's often this this sense of okay we're ready now we're ready to have different perspectives and, and folks from different cultural backgrounds share. Um, I think sometimes it's, it's a lie. <laughs> and they're like, we're ready to have you share in this way um, in, the, in the framework that we designed that feels comfortable to us and may or may not resonate with you, but don't step out of this boundary or else there is no money and there is no access. Uh, so that's another Whew, you know, thing I would like to, to alleviate with my magic wand. Um, and I think part of it is we tend to continue as we've begun. And if we have begun something in an inequitable way where not everybody's voices are heard or we're not on equal footing, um, th that completely needs to be disrupted so that we can have a new beginning where everyone is present in, in the in the co-creation of whatever it is we're going to do next. And, and to your point or to your question, um, Leah, around kind of what is the magic of this moment or what is the power of this moment? It's that uh, we have all collectively had the experience of understanding that we were lied to for so many years. I was told that, well, you just have to be patient, you know, like change is going to come, but you're just going to have to like really be patient because change doesn't happen overnight. And then in March of last year, everything changed in a minute. So you can't tell me that lie anymore. <laughs> like, I don't believe it anymore. I do believe that change is entirely possible when everybody is highly motivated and ready to do it. Um, and ready or not, if it's necessary, we will do it. And I guess what needs to shift is, is that urgency around what is necessary. Because I, I feel like, especially like folks of color have been saying for the long, long time, like things need to change, things need to change, things need to change. Like, I think now is a moment where everyone can hear the urgency and really respond. And it is time for us to start again. Thank you, Reagan. That's absolutely the mic drop I thought would happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what's so fascinating about this conversation is how many elements of our arts landscape influence this conversation around arts criticism and arts journalism, that the, a lot of different shifts need to happen. As shifts happen, I guess, in our arts landscape, on our stages, in our organizations, in the general public perception of the arts, 
kind of with that, this new wave of arts criticism will come um, because it will be necessary, because we'll be hungry for it, um, and because the funding and the perspective behind it will be there. So it's a really interesting framing y'all have created around this conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, please make sure to check out the work of all of these incredible panelists. Um, get Reagan's book, Still Here. Check out Marcy's uh, podcast. Subscribe to the Evergrey and the International Examiner. Um, look into all of the journalism that all of these incredible journalists have created and please do um, read them. I mean, it's just such a feast of, of, um, of artistry. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you everyone who's watching. Have a lovely night.